Welcome to the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, your guide to motorsport sponsorship. Here's your host, Josh Weesey. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, which is powered by Amsoil. Amsoil and I are working together to make sure that you have the information you need to attract and retain sponsors. So this is going to apply to you regardless of if you're a desert UTV racer, supercross, arena cross, a backcountry snowmobiler, drifter, ATV, drag racer, whatever it is, whatever type of motorsports that you participate in, we think this show can help you. Now I do want to take a quick minute and talk to you a little bit more about Amsoil. And I specifically actually want to talk about your truck or your car right now. I mean, how often do you actually think about your motor oil? Probably not that often unless you're like me and you're crazy or it's due for a change. I'm hoping, though, that I can convince you to think about your oil a little bit more seriously and maybe a little bit more often. And here's why. Your oil is the only thing preventing your engine from wearing out and breaking down. So to keep your vehicle running strong, you should look for an oil with added wear protection like the Amsoil signature series synthetic motor oil now this is what i run in my truck it delivers 75 percent more engine protection against horsepower loss and wear than required by the leading industry standard it provides the next level protection today's demanding engines need to keep running for years and if you have a truck like me you need that added protection to keep effortlessly hauling your toys now i want to tell you a quick story about one of my experiences with an oil change that went horrible. So I took my truck in once. I almost always do the maintenance myself, but I took my truck in and said, hey, can you guys just do a tire rotation and check the brakes, let me know how it is, and then go ahead and swap the brakes out if they're bad. Well, came back, they said, yeah, brakes are fine, and uh, you know, you're good to go. So I drove home, and I uh, got home, and I, I saw like oil dripping on the ground. I was like, what's up with this? And then I also saw a rag in the engine compartment. I said, like, what the heck is going on here? Well, I called them back up, and it turns out they did an oil change. And I was furious because they put conventional oil in it, and I had just like three or four weeks earlier done a change to put in the Amsoil uh, 5W30 synthetic. And either way, I took it back to them, and I made them order Amsoil and put it in there. Uh, maybe I was a little rude, but either way, I did not want to run conventional oil in my truck, and I felt like I destroyed the motor for running it like for a day that way. But either way, uh, if you want to find out more about Amsoil, go to amsoil.com slash rider, and I would really love it if you made the switch to Amsoil Synthetic Motor Oil today. That way I know that you are going to be able to keep your vehicle running great tomorrow. Now, our featured guest today is motorsports journalist extraordinaire Casey Cordero. Now, I really want to hear your feedback as well, so head over to iTunes, leave a rating and review. That's one of the best ways that we can give visibility to the show and continue to bring on amazing guests. And whatever podcast player you use, go ahead and subscribe. That's a good way to ensure that you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. Uh, next up, we actually have Kayla Yakov. And the best thing about this is she's coming out with her dad. So Kayla is a youth... Uh, motorcycle racer and we get to spend some time talking through what youth sponsorship challenges are out there and how you can overcome some of those things so really really cool show i highly encourage you checking that out now this episode was also sponsored by solder well they produce game-changing metal bonding technology top the podium.com they're experts in motorsport sponsorship bold racing suspension they're a family race team and custom suspension experts armor coat they simplify your cleaning process and then Crash Addict Industries, they offer human protection and extreme racing products. I also want to give a quick shout out to some of our other partners, including MBRP, HMK, Studboy Traction, GSP XTV, and One Stop Performance. Now in this episode, Casey and I kind of just went on this flow streak. I blew the structure out of the water. So normally I have uh, you know, the qualifier, which is basic intro, Heat 1, which is background, Heat 2, where we cover sponsorship tactics and strategies, and then the main event where we discuss mindset. Got a little shaky in this one because we just did our own thing. Uh, at the end of it, actually, Casey and I were like, what just happened? Uh, so I think those make for pretty good episodes when we kind of lose track. Uh, but either way, I hope that you enjoy this, and we're going to hop into the episode. 
Welcome everybody to this episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, which is powered by Amsoil. And today I'm joined by our featured guests, and I'm going to take a guess right now as to how to actually say your last name. I was supposed to ask you this in the pre-interview. Casey Cordero. 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 Like, yes. The last you are one. correct. The yeah, last one, fine. Cordero. <laughs> I tried to get too fancy at first, I think. Yep. I was like, Cordero, but Cordero. All right, good. But Casey, uh, why don't you uh, <laughs> fill in the gaps from that intro and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, no problem, man. Thank you uh, so much, first and foremost, for having me on the show. Um, it's just a pleasure to be on here, and um, I'm excited because uh, you know I have a I have a big background in uh, in not only off road but uh, motorsports in general, and um, I'm a I'm a journalist by trade, and and really just an overall content creator. So. Anything that has to do with uh, photo and video stuff or press relations, uh, marketing in general, um, I'm all over it in, in the off-road and uh, automotive industry. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely, it's been a, been a wild ride, but I'm, I'm happy to be here, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on here. You know, we talked about this in the pre-interview, and I've said it before on the show, but this show does tend to target a couple different types of guests. And, you know, I, I kind of call it like the three legs of, of, of the target audience here. Uh, and that's content creators, which is the bucket that you kind of fill, the riders and racers themselves, and then also any businesses or, or the people who make, make decisions around sponsorship. Uh, and everybody, honestly, if you're listening right now, you are a content creator yourself. You know, whether it's a social media post or a blog or whatever, we're all content creators uh, in this business. So it's uh, it's important that we learn some of the tips and tricks to make our content stand out. Absolutely, man. Yeah, it's a huge part of, of what we all do. And like you said, I mean, um, from uh, from my t- standpoint of you know doing a lot of web and, and magazine articles and stuff, but a lot of people, you know, I need uh, I need that content from people um, that they're creating, whether it's on social media or press releases or that kind of stuff. Um, you know, to put put what we do together and and make uh, make our make our articles and, and everything that we do, um, you know, come together and race reports, uh, everything like that. So it's a big deal. Yeah, definitely. It's really cool. Definitely. Um, well, I want to better understand your background. So we're going to take heat one to kind of dive in deeper. Um, you know, you gave us some good insights at the, the qualifier there in the intro, but let's dive deeper. So tell us kind of your story. I want to know your journey a little bit more about what you've done in the past, like how you got into motorsports, and then ultimately how you got to where you're at today. Oh man. Okay. Well, uh, when you, when we say that uh, we were born into a sport, I I definitely uh, I, I feel that um, with myself. I mean, I was uh, I was very lucky. The day I was born, my dad uh, went out and uh, and bought me a quad um, as a not not only like a memento, but something that he. Uh, he was obviously very passionate about off-road and, and riding, and, um, you know, he had a motorcycle at the time. Um, he was in love with his CR500s, um, you know, back in the mid-'80s and stuff, and I was born um, in 89. Yeah, like I said, he, uh, he went out and he knew I was okay, and then uh, you know, went out and bought, uh, bought a quad for me, and I, it's really cool. I, I still have it to this day, and um, it's definitely a, a special memento. So uh, being born into it, um, you know, it was a – good choice I, I really didn't have a choice and so uh, i'm very thankful for that um, to well, this day so, first off i'm shocked yeah. that you still have that machine yeah i know it's been uh it's crazy because it's it stayed through our family you know i had it for i think i wrote it until i was 10 or 11 and i i graduated to suzuki lt80 uh, and so i i graduated from that went to a yamaha blaster and then um uh, I think when I was 10 or 11 or so. Um, and then, you know, went, uh, went on from there and I still, uh, I have a, another quad these days. Um, but, uh, I love that LT80, man. It's kind of, it's one of those things where, you know, you've got your favorites and it doesn't, it doesn't get run too much anymore. It's more of a nostalgic thing, but, uh, mm-hmm. it's also been really cool because it's inspired me to, you know, hopefully when I have um, kiddos one day, then I'll be able to, uh, maybe do the same thing for them as well. Yeah. Or they can ride that one. Like that's, yeah, yeah, you still yeah, have it around. That's pretty cool. Those I'll those little quads it. are expensive now. I mean, it's like three grand for a a fifty or something. It's nuts. I know. Even I for know. the used ones, I think back then. Yeah, even for the used ones, yeah, it's crazy. I know. But uh, it's uh, it's amazing how the the market uh, does a circle. Yeah. Well, I uh, I started 
can't remember wh- how old I was. Se- seven or eight or something. Might eh, maybe I don't know. Somewhere around there. Seven plus or minus two. I got a uh, okay. Yamaha Badger 80. And uh, nice. man, oh, I love that thing. It was like purple and yellow, and I don't know. I wore that thing out. I wish I still had it. I actually think about that machine quite a bit, but. I, uh, yeah, I went from that to a Honda Recon 250, like a utility. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, there's been two wheelie machines that I've owned. That was one of them. I could do a wheelie, like a low speed. The balance point was so perfect on it for as long as you wanted. Fuel would just be dumping, dumping out of the carburetor. But like, <laughs> I could just sit there. I'd bur- You could see lines in the grass where I'd just burn the grass up from the fuel dumping out, but... Oh man! As long as you want it. That's wanted. so awesome, man. Yeah, it was. It yeah, was a good time. right. And it's they didn't have a lot of suspension, but man, they, it didn't <laughs> didn't matter, man. We, that's what we all grew up riding. We all had so much fun on those, oh, no I matter remember, what. I remember building a little like wooden ramp with my eighty, and uh, I mean, it was if I got six in, I don't know. It was such a small ramp, and I remember riding that and flipping off of it and just. I don't know. It was it was good times, but for people who know me though, I am definitely not a daredevil at all. So that's my that's like my extreme. I think I I cut it out eight years. That's when I kind of eight years old is when I said nope, I'm done being a daredevil. It was my little <laughs> six inch jumps, but well, it's never too late to start. It is not too late to start, but I'll tell you what, it's <laughs> I would need to do some reprogramming, man, because it's just not. I got the fear in me. I got the fear in me. I like to go oh, fast yeah. though. Yeah, I do. Now I do like to go fast, but uh, well, that's which is probably way more dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, this is about you. Yeah, this is about your story, <laughs> not no, about it's me. Okay. Not about me. Um, so let's let's go let's go next. What happened after that? Yeah. So uh, after uh, growing up. Um, you know, I, I obviously rode the 80 bunch, went out to, uh, went out to Glamis. Um, uh, fortunate to go out there for, for my years growing up and, and, uh, lived in the dunes for a while and, and really just grew, grew a passion for it. So, um, did that through, through high school time. Um, you know, and, and like I said, kind of graduated through, through the ranks with, um, having the, the, um, uh, the blaster and then, uh, had a Raptor at the time and, Mm-hmm. And then uh, now, ultimately, um, I've got a, uh, a 450 that um, I love love riding to this day. And it seems like, and I and I will discuss this later too. But I'm I'm so into the UTV side of things now that it it's really fun for me to throw on my gear and, and go swing away over a quad or a dirt bike too, um, you know, in the garage. So that uh, that's still a huge passion um, of mine and stuff. And and like I said, I mean, I love being able to grow up with that and. Uh, the passion really turned into a career, and and uh, when I graduated high school, I I really wanted to get in the industry more. I had been going uh, for those you know listeners who have been in the the Southwest uh, you know scene for for a while and stuff. You'll know of the Sand Sports Super Show, and it takes place in September every year um, at the Orange County Fairgrounds. And I grew up going to that, and um, as as uh, just chance would have it, I've I've got a friend that that also grew up uh, in the industry and he ended up starting a magazine um, back in the day. And it was, uh, I think 2007 when I, when I graduated and I was at the sand show that year and I, I just randomly asked him, I said, Hey man, you know, like what, what would it take for, uh, to become a writer in the, uh, you know, in the industry and, and not only that for, but for your magazine and stuff. And, and so, uh, that was it. I mean, that was the question I had to ask. And that's why I always encourage people, you know, to this day, like, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions because you never know what one question can do. And, you know, uh, just reaching out to somebody or, you know, anything like that. Uh, it's amazing. Um, what, uh, you know, just what a, what a little, little question or, um, just a little bit of confidence in there, you know, to, uh, to be able to, um, go the extra step and say, Hey, what, what's up, you know, what can I do and stuff? So, Anyways, uh, that uh, that led to an article, and then I, I did a, a quad shootout for them um, that year and stuff, and ended up writing the articles for the for the quad shootout. And, mm. um, I mean, that was it. I was I was hooked. So I've been a I've been a journalist ever since, and um, went through you know went through college and that stuff. Got my degree, and uh, as luck would have it, it, it's not even in uh, it's not even in the journalism world or oh, the off road really? world, but. Yeah, but it's hey, you know that's uh, that's all part of the fun. I, I, um, you know, it, it just wrote me in again. So here we are, right? 
Yeah. What was your degree? I'm curious. Uh, I have a degree in exercise science um, oh. from Northern Arizona. Yeah. So that's you're the second yeah, person I, I know that's had that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of my old managers uh, had that degree. She was actually an HR director at my old company, and uh, yeah, that was nice. that was her thing. That was pretty wild. That's awesome, man. I I love it. You know, it's uh, it's funny because I used it as a as a way to. I really kind of wanted to be like a trainer, like Alden Baker for Ryan Del Poto. Well, yeah. That was back yeah. when, uh, well, yeah, when, uh, when Alden was training him. So that was kind of the inspiration behind it. And, you know, being involved with sport, um, you know, while not really racing, but, you know, uh, being involved in helping people be their, um, you know, be able to, to be their best while out on the track and stuff, um, was a, was kind of a passion. So anyways, that was, uh, that was the background behind it. And then, and then Kawasaki called, so I, <laughs> that was yeah. that was it from there. I went to, uh, on their PR department, and I kind of sidetracked the uh, the doctor side of things. But um, you know that's okay. It's uh, it's not something that we put away forever. I'm sure I could do it in the future. You know, if anything. Yeah. So that's very cool. Yeah. So I went to school. My degree was engineering management, and now I'm an engineering manager. So it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just. I don't know. A lot of people have stories about how it, it, it wasn't at all what their degree is nowhere near what their actual education is. And I was like, I think my title is almost exactly what my degree was. Uh, it is what it is, though. Uh, another note here, yeah. Alden Baker. I came so close to getting him on the show. I, I might still be able to make it happen one day, but he was going to come on the show a long time ago. It was like once I hit a certain download number... You know, he was going to come on, and I hit that number, and I was like, hey, I hit it. Let's go. And, you know, it just hasn't <laughs> happened yet. But, uh, and actually, now I've doubled that number, hey. so maybe I should try again. Uh, there you go. That's huge, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you. you know? And he should come on. He would be, uh, he'd be a great interview. Yeah, I I heard great things. It was actually through uh, uh, Mind FX Science. Um, uh, Kevin McCarthy, he's the owner of that. He works with Alden. Um, in his training program, okay. he's like, oh, yeah, once you hit X number of downloads, like, I'll get him on here. And uh, and I know he still will. I just – it's so hard. You know, it's hard to get get schedules locked down. But So I need to follow up and see if I can make that happen. Yeah. I think every show I do now, I make some commitment about who I'm going to get on the show. And <laughs> if people go back and check me on it, it's like 10% success rate. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Hey, you're trying. That's huge, you know? It, yeah, definitely. I got a list. I have a list that just keeps getting longer <laughs> of people that I reach out to. And so, you know, sometimes people say yes, and sometimes people say nothing. And sometimes, actually, no one's ever just blatantly said no. I don't think so. Yeah, so that's that's got to be a good sign. That's kudos to you, man. You're doing a great <laughs> job. Um, I have a, another quick note, which is a little bit off topic still, but. Yamaha Raptor. Now maybe that was my favorite quad. I had a Raptor 700. It was a 2006, and it was amazing. Like bulletproof, fast. Ah, oh, I loved it. Smooth. Yeah, right. That was uh, 06. I think I had an 03. So I uh, you, I think yeah. 07 maybe was when they came out with EF, uh, the full my, redesign and stuff. So maybe I had the wrong year. Whatever, whatever your mine was was the first year for the EFI. And it was a 700. Okay, so yeah, you were right, yeah. Was it 07 or 07? I'd, I'd have to check, but... I don't know. Either way, it I, was sweet. Yeah. It was white, like silver graphics on it. How my helmet matched it. Oh, it was so cool. I was I was a super cool nice. kid. Nice. No doubt. <laughs> I um, love it, man. That's awesome. So Matching gear and everything. That's what we all love. Exactly. <laughs> I still have that helmet. It's expired now, right? Helmets expire after seven years, but... Uh, yes. Yeah. I still got it. Not that I, not for anybody listening in DOT, I would never use it. Like, you know, it's expired. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but a, uh, what's what's something nowadays? Like, I know you got some cool stuff that you're working on. Uh, you know, what's something you're like excited or fire up, fired up about right now? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm fired up just because I I uh, I'm working with a lot of different um, whether they're websites or, or magazines in the industry. Um, it's kind of kind of where I positioned um, the new company and stuff and just making sure that, uh, you know, I'm pushing out content to, to a lot of different ones. So uh, I'm really excited about it. You know, work with uh, whether it's ATV Escape or offroad.com or 
UTV Underground, um, UTV Guide, and SS, SNS Off Road uh, Mag, to, to name a few. Um, um, they're all they're all great companies within the industry, and um, you know they uh, they definitely they're good. Uh, it's a lot of focus on UTVs, like I was saying earlier. Um, it's definitely the the biggest portion of the market right now. But at the same time, we try to try to get in a lot of ATV stuff too. Um, and I just uh, just did an ATV review on a Kawasaki Brute Force. Mm. Um, so again, utility quad. So you know. Uh, you'd, yeah, I think you'd appreciate that one um, mm-hmm. on there. So <laughs> it was uh, it was a really fun review. And speaking of the brute force, my brother, he's got a 2008 brute force 650. And if you like, if you ever needed a confessionary story to sell some Kawasaki's, <laughs> like my brother loves his machine and he rides it hard. And people come out there with like 850s and thousands, and he just tears past them in the mud. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's an incredible uh, machine. But man, you just get them going. Yeah. Like, hey, you like your Kawasaki Brute Four 650? Oh yeah, man, man, man. And they'll just <laughs> yeah. talk for hours about how amazing it is. Uh, which That's is, awesome. Is, I love it. That you'd be amazed, man. It was crazy. I was on, uh, I was working on a PR team with Kawasaki. We'd have so many stories about that. Um, and, and really it just, so many people, um, would come up to us and just like, man, I've, I've had my Cowie for years, you know, like I really don't want to buy a new one because it's so reliable. But then again, you know, you guys make a great product. So, you know, it's really cool to have a new one and stuff. And it's really hard to, to turn over, uh, you know, to turn over, um, product when they make such a good one. Um, you know, out of the box so yeah definitely anyways it's a definitely. it's a good thing but it's also a disadvantage but you know i always uh, i always encourage people like it's it's good to to uh it's, it's always better to put out a great product so they definitely, definitely. do that for sure definitely well what i want to do now i'm gonna take a quick break but when we come back we are going to talk a little bit more about sponsorship tactics and strategies and we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into content creation and some tips and tricks around that so but right now, though, we're going to take just a, a quick pause to thank the sponsors for this podcast. I am constantly asking the guests of this podcast how they attract and retain sponsors. And on almost every single occasion, somebody gives an example of a resume. A rider or a racer resume is extremely important to your overall sponsorship pitch and proposal. And it's tough to do. I mean, it's not really the easiest thing. Anybody can go through and put together a resume, so don't get me wrong there, but it's really difficult to get something that's like unique and different and stands out. And it also is something that can be put across multiple platforms. Well, that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about next is how topthepodium.com can actually help you build a race or writer resume that can be used on multiple platforms. I'm talking like website, PDF, you know, something you can print off that's interactive, that looks fantastic. It looks absolutely professional. Well, that's because it's made by a professional. This is the type of thing that's going to set you apart from the crowd and that's going to position you for a strong sponsorship proposal. So what I want you to do next is go to topthepodium.com. And if you have a question, there's a little chat icon that pops up on the side of the screen when you go to topthepodium.com and you can go ahead and type your question right there. Jeff Vanistall, he is the owner of Top the Podium. He's going to be able to respond to you directly. So check it out. Have you ever been out on the trail or at the track or in the middle of the desert and something breaks? Well, of course you have. We've all been there. But a lot of people at that point, they reach into their trusty toolbox for the duct tape or the zip ties or wrenches to fix their machine. However, there's a feeling that you get when you realize you need more than just duct tape to fix that rock chip in your radiator. That's a horrible, horrible feeling to have. And that's why I'm going to tell you next about Solderweld's metal bonding products, specifically alloy saw. So this product gives you a longer term fix than JB Weld, which is just going to get you back to the trailer or back to the pits. Basically, the assistance of map gas or propane torch, you can quickly and easily repair an oil cooler, radiator, AC line, or any crack or hole in aluminum. And better yet, alloy soil flux is the only flux in industry that cleans and decontaminates the dirty and greasy surface for you. So you don't even have to worry about that part. 
The alloy sole rods are actually capable of a 30,000 PSI fix, and they're stronger than even the parent metal, and they're built to last the lifetime of the part. So don't let a simple radiator leak leave you out of the race or broken down in the trail. Bring along some alloy sole aluminum alloy repair rod and flux from Solder Weld. I hear it constantly from racers that a good suspension setup is absolutely critical for performance. And that's why I'm going to talk to you next about bold racing and suspension. Now, it's really critical to understand your suspension. And there's so many intricacies with the valving and the, the shims and all this crazy equipment that you need to actually you know, rebuild and properly set up your suspension that it's really important if you're ready for that next level of, of performance to partner with an awesome suspension company. Now, Bold Racing is that company. They're not only specialists with their suspension setups, but they also partner with companies that produce amazing custom components. And on top of that, they're a family race team. They actually race themselves, so they really understand the type of beating that your vehicle and your shocks can take. So what I want you to do is give them a call and just chat with them. Talk to them about suspension. Their number is 702-506-5354. If you're not ready for a phone call, go ahead and shoot them an email, bold.racing at yahoo.com. I don't know about you, but I absolutely can't stand cleaning the mud, filth, grime, goo, garbage off my machines after I go for a ride. It's just frustrating. It takes a lot of time. That's why I'm going to talk to you about Armor Coat next. Armor Coat is designed to help prevent mud, clay, ice, and other grime from sticking to your machine. It makes the cleanup quick and easy. It makes the machine actually look fantastic. And beyond that, it smells phenomenal. I don't know how to describe it like bubble gum or something like that. It smells great. If you want to know more about Armor Coat, visit ArmorCoatProducts.com and you will see their entire product line, all the offerings. Armor Coat is also working on some new stuff. They're soon going to release a solution made for coating the helmet and visor and also one for wheels to help prevent mud buildup for high temp areas. So make your move now. Go to ArmorCoatProducts.com. Make a decision that's going to allow you to shorten the amount of time that you spend cleaning so that you can increase the amount of time that you spend riding and racing. Safety is our overriding priority. I hear it all the time, but I have to ask myself, is it though? Is that the first thing we think of? Is that the first thing you think of? Over the past couple of years, we've seen the performance of production UTVs increase, I don't know, somewhere around 350%. That means these machines give us a lot more opportunity to have fun and win races, but it also unfortunately gives us new opportunities to crash. And that's why we have partnered with Crash Addict Industries. The owner, Travis Pointer, became very accustomed to crashing early in his career. He saw it as inevitable, and he set out to make the process safer. With a passion for racing, welding, and engineering, Crash Attic Industries now produces full cage and other protection systems intentionally designed to protect you during an accident on the track. They also offer a line of human protection products through their vendors. Do this for me at this point. If you're racing with a stock cage right now, please go check out CrashAddict.com and see, at least just see what they have to offer. Even if you choose to go with a different company, please, please, please make safety your overriding priority. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are now in Heat 2, Sponsorship Tactics and Strategies. This is the meat of the show. So the first part of the show, we focus on getting you acclimated to the guests, helping you understand their background, ultimately why you should listen to what they're saying, and now we talk about what they're going to say. So uh, I want to talk first about relationship building so from your standpoint, you, you're involved with a number of businesses, uh, you know, in, in industry magazines and, you know, PR areas. So let's, I don't know, let's walk through a couple examples of how you've built some relationships in, in this arena. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think for me um, and, and for anybody really that's uh, that's looking to, to either grow their business or grow uh, sponsorship, you know, um, acquisition, that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's all about networking. Um, as you know, I've seen 
listened to your podcast in the past. I mean, a lot of people say it, but it, but it really does ring true. Um, networking is everything, you know, and so you got to, you got to take advantage of every different, uh, you know, show that you go to or race that you go to, um, anything like that. And, and really just try to meet, meet the people that, um, either run the, you know, run the companies that you're trying to go after or, um, you know, anything like that. It's, uh, it definitely, it's one of those things where, um, networking and communication, uh, those are the top two, uh, top two strategies for being able to, uh, to meet the right people. So, um, it's worked for me, uh, you know, obviously a lot in the past of being able to, um, foster the relationships, um, with whether they're magazines or websites, um, and stuff, uh, just being able to, to meet the editors and, and, um, you know, being able to, uh, just see what, what content they need and what they are looking for, um, too. So, Again, um, it goes back to, to really doing your research and, and uh, you know, seeing who the right people are to meet and, and um, go from there. So I want to dive in a little bit into what you said there around networking because it does come up on this show a lot. And it happens for a reason. So if people are listening and it hasn't sunk in yet, networking is very important. But when we say networking, we don't just mean you go to a race, you meet some people, shake some hands. Like that's not – that's only scratching the surface yeah. of networking. So one example I like to remind people of is it came from Thomas Affelt. I think it was on episode 48 of the show. He's been on the live version as well. But he basically said he runs an Instagram profile in a small business uh, called Sledders R Us. And he described how he does networking. He has a spreadsheet that he tracks. He has over a 1,000 names of contacts on his spreadsheet and every time he has a conversation with somebody whether it's on you know private message or whatever it may be over the phone he he types in or tracks something about them to, so that he can go back later and understand how they connected what the relationship meant it may only be a couple of lines per person but like he that takes work you have a thousand people that you're trying to manage <laughs> from a networking standpoint that takes work i mean honestly social networking uh facebook twitter instagram you ask anybody who's got a big following that takes work you know and you don't just post stuff and leave it i mean you're analyzing hashtags and you're making sure that you find key influencers and reaching out to them to see if they'll share your your content or you share their content or you're commenting on different people's posts specific influencers it's like it is legitimate work to to network Hey, the word the word is in it. Work, <laughs> network, get it? I never, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh... <laughs> to dive a, a deeper, actually, in a different co- uh, topic too, around um, you know going to events and making some of those connections, because you said that um, it's huge. You got to go to them, though. I mean, you have to go out there and, and meet hands. Yeah. So, or meet hands, <laughs> meet people, shake hands, uh, kiss babies. Uh, not. Not to be confused with kissing hands and shaking babies. That's bad. Uh, you right. want to shake hands and kiss babies. But, you know, that takes work, too, to, to schedule that stuff. Right. And and, and really, um, you know, as you said, I mean, the work all starts um, beforehand, too. I mean, it's, it's it, you can really do um, a lot of it um, before you even go to the events, do the shows and that kind of stuff. I mean, like you said, social media is it's kind of a bear sometimes because of the time that it takes and everything, but you can really use it to your advantage too. And it makes, uh, I heard a great analogy the other day. Um, it was actually on another podcast uh, that I was listening to. And, and the guy was talking about social media and how really it's made the world a, a small place again, because, you know, you can theoretically know everyone um, or not everyone, but a great majority of the people are on social media. So you can, you can make the world a small place again. Um, so, you know, that's where the work really can start, um, for you if you're resilient at it and, and you really use it to your advantage. So you, you can find the right people, um, you know, that you're, that you're trying to meet, um, you know, that you, you know, so you're basically, you can cut your time down, you know, when you go to events or go to races, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're trying to meet the, the head uh, marketing guy at a, at a company and, you know, you don't know who it is and you just go and you, you ask a random guy, you know, at the booth and, they're like, ah, yeah, you know, I'm not sure, but, you know, maybe he's been told that, uh, or he or she have been told that, you know, if they get any random questions about the main marketing guy, then, you know, or who it is essentially, um, then, you know, they're not supposed to say anything, but at the same time, if you go in there with a name and 
say, yeah, you know, I've, I've tried to contact them in the past and, you know, this is what I want to talk to them about and stuff. I mean, I think they're, they're, they're not going to have a lot of reluctancy to, to say, yeah, you, you know, here's, here's right over here. And this is who you need to talk to and, you know, and stuff and, and just be able to kind of initiate the conversation. And really once you've got that conversation going, I mean, your networking is, it started at home, but now you're really on the ball, you know, you're going forward and, and you're, you're meeting the right people and you're engaging. And then, um, like you said, you can make those lists, um, to be able to follow up and, and really the, the follow up too is, is one of the most important parts because you're, you're re-engaging and you're re reinitializing that conversation to, uh, you know, further your, uh, further your, your goals and they get to know more about you and they're going to be prompted to be like, man, you know, uh, my sponsorship budgets or, or my, um, you know, my, my outlines and stuff for, for next year, my marketing um, goals for next year are opened up and man, this guy, you know, or this girl really came up to me at this one show and they were super energetic and man, I, I just really want them on my team. So here we go. Like, let's land it, you know? So they're going to, they're going to put you forward, you know, before the other guy who wasn't sure, you know, who to reach out to or, or you know, didn't put that effort forward um, in, in doing the networking with them. Yeah. I was listening to a, a podcast earlier today and for people listening we're recording on june 7th of 2018 and um i was listening to this podcast and it was about influencers and making sales and they basically said what you're doing when you're trying to influence or persuade somebody is you're not trying to make them you're not trying to manipulate I mean, some people do, I guess, which is never received what good, but you're trying to make them like yeah. you. And if people like you, then they actually want to do something for you. Like persuasion isn't about making somebody do something for you. It's about providing the stimulus for someone else to want or choose to do something for you. That's what persuasion really is. So you're trying to persuade someone, uh, you know, maybe it's for a, a to, to sponsor you, but really you're trying to, you're trying to make them like you. That's, that's the, the, the first piece of it. So if you walk up to somebody at an event and you can start that conversation and, and there is a connection there and they do like you, well, you've now positioned yourself for whatever that next step is. Right. Right. And it's, it's interesting too. And I'll uh, give a little relation from, uh, from our uh, journalistic standpoint, but the, the manufacturers, um, whether automotive or power sports will, will do the same thing to us um, journalists too. You know, they'll try to uh, make sure that we have a, a wonderful experience so that we can uh, say the most uh, amazing things about the machine and stuff. And, and it's really our job to be able to not only, you know, we're there to, to support the manufacturer too, but um, you know, it's my job to be able to say, okay, so, you know, yes, they, they say that this is all new feature on a, on a particular machine, but at the end of the day, how is it, is it really making the machine better and how is it going to benefit, um, you know, you, if you're going to go out and buy one. So that's, uh, that's where, I mean, I, I love that aspect of, of my job is to really kind of bring out the, the ends that you're not going to think about, um, of a, a new vehicle or an existing vehicle, um, you know, so that you can have the most informed decision on, you know, whether or not you should go buy it because, um, just because one platform, um, in a, in an ATV or a UTV or a snowmobile for that matter is, is, uh, technically or, or via, uh, marketing, you know, ideas, um, via the manufacturer and stuff. If they're saying it's the best or anything, that doesn't necessarily mean that it really is the best because they're trying to convince you. But, um, again, it's, it's my job to be able to say, well, you know, pump the brakes a little bit and, uh, you know, see, see what this really does. And if it's really going to help you, then awesome. If it's not, then, you know, we need to, to take a broader scope and, and look at a vehicle or, or, um, something, you know, to be able to say, okay, so how do we, how do we really go about this? You know, does it, uh, does it make something better or, or not or, or what? You know? Yeah. And one thing I want to kind of divert into about that is what you were just saying there is, you're taking the approach where you're trying to get to the facts and relay the facts and like here's – we're, we're going to take the marketing jargon or the marketing language and we're going to convert this into something that people can use to make a good informed decision. And honestly, as a sponsored rider or a sponsored racer, you're not doing much different from that. So you're in a lot of cases testing a product or showcasing a product and – if you truly believe, and this is something I definitely recommend, I, I recommend that you 
should truly believe in the product you're using because that way when you're selling it and you're pitching it, it's coming from a place of utter sincerity. Most riders and racers are not sales salespeople. They're not master persuaders. You know, they are people who, and especially the successful ones, that truly value the product or whatever it is that they are trying to market and they truly value the company. And then it's natural. Like you just want to purchase as a consumer, you want to purchase the thing that, you know, Ryan Dungey or Ken Block or whatever, you want to purchase what they're what they're using or what they're driving because you know that they actually believe in it. Yes, absolutely, man. I mean that rings true in in, in so many facets. I mean um, just like you were saying, when you're, you know, when you believe in the product, it, it, uh, it makes a difference and it makes a difference whether the, the sponsored rider, uh, realizes it or not, but it does make a difference in their posts and, and, um, you know, the content that they push out, uh, social media, I've seen so many people that, uh, you know, they they'll get paid for a post or, or something like that. And, and it, you know, sometimes they can make it to where it feels genuine, you know, and they really, they believe in, in what they're promoting, but, um, you know, a lot of times you'll find that, you know, the more that they're paid to do it, um, and not monetarily wise, I'm not saying more, but just the more that they're, they're paid to, um, uh, to post about a certain product or anything, and they really don't believe in it, it gets more and more artificial, um, in some way. So like you said, it's imperative that, uh, that you believe in it, um, that you, that you want to market it, um, and that, you know, you have the freedom to, to market it in your own way too. Um, I realize that, you know, some sponsorships you have to, you have to be able to adhere to a company's guidelines or, or oh, something yeah. like that, um, you know, when posting, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely, um, it helps when, when companies allow you to have the freedom to be able to say, you know what? Yeah. So, Hey man, I want to, I want to kind of cross genre here. So if like you were taking a, a Fox racing, uh, moto gear setup or something, and you wanted to go take it into a UTV and, and frankly, you know, like Fox racing is, is not huge into UTVs. Um, you know, with their gear and stuff, but, you know, I've got this idea or this video project that I'm working on and stuff. And, you know, do you guys mind if I, I do something with it? And they're going to be like, heck no, you know, like, yeah, I mean, make it happen, you know, and stuff. And they want that, they want that extra effort and that extra initiative to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of bridging the gap between, you know, different genres of, of, of the power sports industry or automotive, you know, whatever you're into and stuff. And it's a, just an added bonus for the company that you're working with really. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that I wanted to talk about after you just said that, um, I was thinking of – actually, it's, it's an episode that I just did with uh, Brandon Tadizzle Cox. Uh, he runs uh, Tadizzle Films and Sledders 2.0 uh, on, on Facebook. and a num- I mean, he's involved in a lot of stuff. But either way, one of the things that he brought out was how he made his connection with 509, which is, you know – a big snowmobiling uh, gear company. And um, Absolutely, yeah. he was saying like what they needed was content. And he created this video uh, a number of years back. I think it was like 2010, if I recall correctly, but he created this video where he was using back when GoPros didn't have all the mounts or whatnot. It was like taped to his helmet or something, but either way he made this video and he edited it, and it, you could see the 509 logo, and it that was not his intent. He was just making a cool video. Well, they saw it. 509 saw it, and they thought it was phenomenal, and they were like, we need content. That is what we need. Like, we don't even need you to sell stuff right now. We'll still sell it. Like, we need good content that showcases what our products can do. So that's how his relationship formed was just by going out there and creating something um, – that that the companies just needed um and so what you just said kind of made me think of that and i i think that that's ultimately what what sponsored riders and racers are we're influence influencer marketers that are out there uh trying to provide really good content to showcase our sponsors products yeah absolutely and 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 you just hit the nail on the head too sometimes uh, not all the time but but a lot of times it just takes that extra initiative by somebody to go out and make their own video or, or, you know, they've got an idea that they've always wanted to do, but, um, you know, they pitched it through the company, but they're not really, they're not getting any traction with it or anything. And, um, sometimes it just, it takes that extra effort to just say, man, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to go out and do it. Or I'm going to go film this, this one scene in this, you know, rad place that I've been looking at for years and no one's ever done it before and stuff. And, 
you know, I don't have the support, but at the end of the day, like, I just want to make it happen. So, you know, that's literally just make it happen, you know, and try to, uh, to go that extra effort because they'll end up seeing it and man, it can pay off huge dividends in the long run, um, for you, you know, obviously with, uh, it possibly in the way of sponsorship and stuff, um, or at least getting your foot in the door in, in some areas. And then, um, you know, you never know what it's going to build out to there, um, you know, in the future. Right. You know, I just thought of another example, and you and I had talked a little bit about Matt Martelli uh, and Josh Martelli in the pre-interview, and they both were on this show in the past. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember what numbers they are, but if you go to the website and and search Martelli, uh, SponsoredRiderClubPodcast.com, you could find either of those episodes. But uh, they talked about Jim Gymkhana, the first Jim Gymkhana movie with Ken Block. I mean, Ken Block's massive, right? He, he's super popular, has been for a long time. But basically, Matt and Josh had this idea uh, with Ken to make this 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 uh, video on social media, on YouTube, uh, with really cool drift stuff. And they pitched it to some people, and they're like, eh, no. Doesn't sound that great to me. <laughs> and they're like, well, whatever, we're going to do it anyway. So Ken Block's like, look. I'm just going to I'm paying for this out of my, out of my pocket. We're just going to do it cuz I think it's cool. And I mean that's that's what birthed the real that's what what caused a lot of Ken Block success and and, and definitely Mad Media and, and the Martelli brothers like they've made multiple Jim Conna movies. Uh you know, obviously they've they've branched into XP1K movies and like they've done a ton of good stuff and it all sparked from that time but they had to make a decision and that it wasn't anybody else doing this for them. They were doing it themselves because they, they knew that there was something there. They knew that they had something that peop, other people hadn't created before. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. And, and just uh, to, to um, reiterate what you were saying too, I mean, the Martelli brothers have been a huge inspiration for, for off-road and, and for me personally too, just because we they've, they've been able to, to show us that, um, you know, off-road and been racing and stuff knows no boundaries. You know, you can, uh, you can really kind of create your own niche, uh, niche in there, um, with what you're doing. So they've, they've done it, um, expertly, you know, for, uh, for a while now. And, and it's definitely something where, um, you know, like I, I, I wasn't into, into the automotive market, you know, before, and, and I've kind of uh, been able to, to branch out into that and stuff. So, you know, definitely don't, uh, and this is, you know, just advice for, for people, but, you know, don't, don't put your walls up with, uh, or box yourself into a, a certain category, you know, of the industry and stuff, because really, um, it, it goes, goes everywhere. I mean, you'll see Ram, Ram trucks or, um, you know, energy, obviously energy drinks and stuff you see all over the place, but, um, uh, nature's Valley has been one that I've seen on a couple, uh, a supercross team and, and motocross team, um, recently. And, and they're a, you know, a nutrition bar and stuff. So basically what I'm saying is, you know, look outside of the industry too for different opportunities to, to get you um, where you want to go, you know, with things. Yeah. That's awesome that you said that. Yeah. I, um, I've talked about it on the show a number of times, but it's very critical to reemphasize it. So I personally want to see the motorsports world flourish. I love it. I love being around it. I love talking about it. Uh, I want to see motorsports flourish, and we got to have money coming into the industry to make that happen. You know, if we look at the size of the market for endemic sponsors, which is people within motorsports, it's limited, right? If you pull out the non-endemic, which is outside of motorsports, if you pull out the Red Bulls, the Monsters. You know any of those the 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 non motorsport specific products. If you pull them out of motorsports, motorsports might not be able to support itself. So the way to make mm-hmm. this industry flourish is we have to pull more of that stuff in. And when I say we, I mean if you're listening to this, like you're part of this conversation too. My part of the game <laughs> yeah. is is to share this knowledge with people and say this is important. But your part is to go out and get some of those those sponsors bring in like supercuts was one that George Hamill, he's been on the show a couple times. George Hamill went out and got supercuts for a couple years as one of his main title sponsors. Sweet. We're getting money from outside industry inside the industry. Um, 
Robert Haslam, I think, yeah, Robert Haslam was on 68, episode 68. He brought in, I'm going to mess the name, it was like Kumbacha, some energy drink. I'm like, sweet, let's get more of that in there. I mean, NASCAR has got it figured out. They got M&Ms and all sorts of stuff, even though M&Ms made, a, in my opinion, a poor decision on their driver, but that they sponsor. Kyle, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a Kyle Busch fan. I don't like them, but, uh, but either way, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's hard with Kyle because he's a wheel man. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, you gotta gotta love his personality. Which which I guess that's one reason that motorsports are so great. You know, can't like everybody. You know what? For sure. Yeah, I uh, actually I should hide. Actually, if Kyle Busch finds out that I've bad mouthed him like three times on the show, he he's <laughs> he's not gonna be happy. He's definitely gonna call me out in an interview. But uh, I should actually thank Kyle Busch because he has given me some examples. I I. I don't want people to act necessarily like that when they do speeches and stuff. So, uh, so he's helped. I'll, I'm a glass, uh, not just half full, but super full kind of guy, uh, overflowing kind of guy. And he has helped me provide new examples for the audience uh, of things to, to avoid in their sponsorship program. There you go. We appreciate that about you. It's, um, yes. it's awesome. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I think um, it's, uh, it's definitely an encouragement just to reiterate again. I mean, definitely um, looking outside of, of this world, I, I liken it to the, the snowmobile industry. You guys know more about this than, than I do, but, you know, uh, um, I've just kind of gotten a, a little taste of it um, with uh, with just different companies and, and Jess, my girlfriend and stuff. But she she's introduced me to the fact that, you know, the snowmobile market is very, very small. And, and when you when you look at it as a whole, um, you can't be going after all the same companies that all the big teams are going after and stuff because they've already got the big followings. They've already got, you know, the, the, uh, the race packages set up and stuff. So they're going to, they're going to have more of a, of an in, you know, with these different companies with it too. So, you know, the more you can, uh, you can look outside of, of the sport and be able to bring people in, um, especially now, I mean, the economy is rocking. So, you know, make sure that that proposal that you make up is, is not necessarily just geared towards one company, but it's very, almost open-ended and, and broad so that you can uh, you can tailor it to be able to send out to different companies and i mean go go big right or the saying is go big or go home right so you know i mean definitely uh spot that one that one company that's on the side of a billboard when you're driving or you know the uh the tv commercial that you said man there's no way i could ever get that company well go for it you know i mean linkedin is a great place to find a marketing manager for that company so mm-hmm. make it happen you know that's exactly right. I highly recommend using LinkedIn. If you're not already on there, get a profile put together. It's a very professional environment, and it does give you access to people. A lot of people post their titles on there. You can search by title. Um, you can search by company. I, I I definitely recommend getting on LinkedIn. If you're not already there, build a presence. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way to reach out. Um, mm-hmm. and, then, and then also what you just said about go big or go home – numerous people on here who have had some of the biggest sponsors out there, right? You know, Polaris or any, like any factory rides, you know, NGK, Monster, whatever it is. They've said at one point, I could not ever imagine having been, you know, being sponsored by this awesome company. Like I couldn't fathom it when I reached out or when I asked, um, if yeah. you don't ask, the answer is always no. That's like that's a given. If you don't ask, the answer is no. But absolutely, you gotta yep. gotta gotta try it. Yeah, and and it's so cool because one of uh, if you follow desert racing, um, especially recently uh, for the Baja 500 that was last weekend, one of the the greatest stories to come out of desert racing, at least in my mind, in the last couple of years has been um, Andy McMillan, and he you know he was racing full time. Uh, back in earlier in the 2000s uh, with a factory Red Bull sponsorship, racing trophy truck, having huge success and stuff. And then he took some time off, um, lost his, his sponsorship, not, not necessarily because he took some time off, but, um, you know, just uh, over the time, lost his sponsorship and never thought he was going to actually get it back. Well, turns out that, you know, through his hard work and, and kind of taking the extra step to fund his race team, um, and to, to put the extra effort out there the last two years of coming back into desert racing, he now just announced, um, you know, and for the Baja 500, he had his Red Bull factory sponsorship back. And I mean, that's a, I, I realize that's a, that's a huge deal. Um, 
you know, and, and many of us won't, won't have that, you know, crazy, uh, Red Bull sponsorship, um, just because it's an elite, elite deal in that way. But that's not saying that you're never going to be able to, to go after that dream. You know, he's living proof that, you know, you can, you can think you're, you know, done with racing and then say, man, you don't know, I really want to come back and I really want to make this happen. Well, you know, that's the beauty of it is that you can, and you can make it happen and look at him. I mean, he's got his Red Bull sponsorship back and I see it all the time, especially in the UTV industry where, you know, the UTV industry is a great example because it's grown from having, you know, 12 of what we called golf carts back in uh, you yeah. know, 2008, 2009, you know, racing around in a desert race and being one of the slowest classes to now, I mean, these full on builds are, are uh, pretty ridiculous, really. I mean, in a, in a good way. I mean that, um, you know, because they're just hundred thousand dollar race builds and they're almost as fast as a class 10 car, um, you know, and stuff. And it's, it, they're just built they're built to handle pretty much anything the desert will throw at you. And, and these also, these guys are bringing in, uh, like you said, the, the pl- factory player sponsorships, um, you know, can am's coming in with a huge, uh, race program, um, Yamaha's in it, you know, I mean, all these big factories are there and that's why this industry is just absolutely blowing up and it just, it's getting bigger and bigger. And, um, I don't, you know, I mean, it, I'm sure one day it will, uh, flatline to some extent, but, um, you know, that's definitely, uh, it's not right now. It just continues to grow. And it's a great example of what you can do and what you can get into. Yeah. And I just want to help people understand the scope. If you're not into desert racing, I mean, you know, Casey, you just said the hundred thousand are UTVs. You know, if you look at some of these trophy trucks that are out there, like what Andy McMillan's racing, yeah. I mean, it's 50 grand prep work, probably minimum per race. And they're probably he's probably yeah. doing minimum five races, like big races a year. So when we talk about like a, you know, a fact or a, a Red Bull sponsorship, I mean it's big. Like you, when you're at the, at that level, if you don't have a significant sponsor or a significant level of personal wealth, you're not racing. Like you can't yeah. make the entry fees, you can't do the the truck prep. So it is a, it's serious. Even I, uh, in episode 52, we had Megan Meyer on here. Uh, she was an NHRA racer. She goes through 15 grand in just spark plugs a season. Just, just <laughs> spark crazy. plugs. Like the simplest thing on a, on a, well, maybe not simplest, but uh, an easy part to replace, very common part on, on a, a machine in 15k a year and that's just one piece of her entire car like you have to have some serious support to make something like that possible yeah no it's true and that's um and i i love writing about this stuff too is really you know another reason that the utv industry is so so appealing and utv racing and 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 just specific is so appealing is just because there's such a broad range of uh not only classes but um you know availability of, of, of parts and vehicles and and everything like that i mean you can have don't get me wrong like i said you can have the hundred thousand dollar utv race car there's no doubt about it and they are everywhere out there because more and more mm-hmm. people are getting into it but um the beauty of it is that with manufacturers being so involved it's kind of like the motorcycle industry where you know, like a stock machine a stock motorcycle uh, or like say you're going to buy a, a 450 um, and go race, you know, an outdoor track or something on an outdoor track. Um, a stock machine is, is damn good, you know, um, mm-hmm. right off the showroom floor and UTVs, whether you're going to buy, um, an XP turbo razor or, um, you know, a Maverick X3 or a YXZ from Yamaha or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of great stock machines now that offer great platforms for you to build off of that you don't necessarily need to spend a hundred thousand dollars on, exactly. but you can get out there, you know, in a, in a production class and be able to, you know, if you can, if you can keep the car together and you know, you know, you obviously you, you uh, learn how to drive, um, you know, in that racing environment and stuff. I mean, you can really, really do well uh, on, you know, on a, on a little bit of a budget. Um, and the beautiful part of it is too, like not only in the desert racing series, but I watched uh, like the GNCC series back East in the U S um, quite a bit. And like that just, not only does that look like a blast, but at the same time, like the machines there, they're built stout, but they don't have the crazy amount of parts in there um, that like a desert race car would have. So you can go and you can race that pretty cost effectively, um, you know, and, and be able to not only have a blast, but be able to attract the big name sponsorships because GNCC is on TV. They're on, 
mm-hmm. um, you know, they, they get a bunch of press and stuff. And so you can, you can really uh, just exercise those opportunities, you know, go race and yeah. go attract some sponsors. Yeah. And what we're seeing in the, the desert world is people, one, they're getting into the program, like you said, and the naturally aspirated UTVs, getting enough sponsors to, to cover the cost, to, to get in, you know, race fees or fuel costs or whatever it is. And then they race, have some success, build their program, learn a thing or two. Then they might step into the 6100 or maybe they'll step into a trophy truck in the, later on. So, you know, it's not like you said, it's not $100,000 right off the bat potentially i mean maybe it is but you but you can build to that you can start smaller and you have the opportunity to to, to grow your program and um you know all of a sudden you you find out that you're 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 doing these hundred thousand dollar deals um but but yeah don't don't get me wrong too like that's one reason why we do this show too is if you're sitting at a point right now where you just you just have um product sponsors maybe you got a discount 25 percent off discount like that's step one let's keep going let's build on that because there's nothing that says you can't get to that next level but it's it's hard work like it is not uh none of these people just get it this stuff given to them i mean even even the people who are um you know grow up in families that are really good at this stuff they still are putting in blood sweat and tears to make this stuff happen yes Exactly. And, and that's, uh, that's the beauty of, of what you guys talk about on the podcast too, is encouraging people to, to look, you know, to, um, just look at the different opportunities, you know, that are there and stuff. Um, I, you just, uh, reminded me of, of like the, the mid 400 is a great example. Um, you know, and the Martelli brothers too, with putting that together, but, uh, definitely like if you were going to go race the mid 400, you know, if, and you were putting together a proposal to do this, um, you know, to build a car for it or something, um, you know, don't forget about the fact that like when you're pitching sponsors, you know, the mint, um, comes with huge media packages, you know, for this. And, and a lot of people don't forget this, but, you know, just make sure you have all the details in your sponsorship proposals, so, you know, and stuff too, of, you know, not only is it on, um, you know, TV, uh, but it's, it goes up on YouTube. I mean, it has all these different media opportunities, um, you know, for you to be a part of. And that's really, uh, all of those opportunities allow, give, give you as a racer or, um, you know, really as a, a potential sponsored rider, um, you know, the, op- the, the leverage and opportunity to be able to pitch these companies and say, man, they're like, this is a, this is a big deal and, and I want to be a part of it. And here's how you can be a part of it. You know? Yeah. And I recommend people, if you're putting together these pitches, get granular, like break it into those details of, you know, Hey, I've got the logo on the side of my, trailer and i have to drive ten thousand miles or whatever it is to get to this place i expect you know two thousand people are going to see it along the way that's you know a dollar per exposure i don't know get granular get into the details like 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 you're saying mint 400 has media packages gncc has media packages they have the stats if you need the stats if you want to better understand those there are people that can help you say yeah we expect x number of viewers you know, your screen time, if you're leading, might be 15% of the time or 50% of the time. If you're not, then it's X percentage of the time. You can start building that into your proposal. Same with social media. Like, there's so many metrics that you can get with social media, and you can share that stuff. I don't care if you screenshot it or if you make your own graphs or if you have your own metrics dashboard, <laughs> but, like, you can... I think people don't know how much they're actually doing. Like if you're not tracking it and paying attention, you don't realize how much exposure you're actually getting. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And it's, it, uh, you can, like you said, you can use all of that, um, you know, to your advantage, uh, just in, in so many different facets. Um, and you know, once you, once you lay, nail down a, you know, a sponsor for doing something like this and stuff, then, I mean, the follow-up is huge there. And again, you know, making sure that they know that, you know, they got this bang for the buck out of, out of their sponsorship and, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty, just like you were saying with the proposal, um, do it again, you know, for the follow-up and stuff so that people really they have it triggered in their mind that you are, you know, doing your best to get the most value out of this um, activation, you know, and stuff. So it's good. It's, it's a full circle strategy, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? We're, I went way off 
off script today, which is which is good. We've been getting good good topics, but uh, I want to continue to go off script for a couple more minutes because I want to ask you a little bit just around from the PR standpoint and from you know. And by PR, I mean I mean public relations, but I'm also going to talk about press releases and things like that, magazine articles. How do you recommend people get that exposure? I mean, that's the world you play in. How do you recommend people get noticed by the editors, get noticed by the journalists? Um, I mean, what are your recommendations there? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's tough because the... Uh, well, it's not tough. I mean, you can... You can do it in a number of ways. Obviously, winning races and stuff is a is a huge, easy way to. Uh, well, I shouldn't say easy. That is not an easy thing to do. But winning <laughs> races um, is a great way to yeah. uh, get you know PR for yourself. Um, you know, and so that uh, that's inherently you know what uh, people do because they will they'll run race recaps and then you'll be uh, listed up there with you know not only your name but name will be getting more known and that kind of stuff. But um, for, for most of us, and, and even for, for winning, this, this applies um, all the time, is really keeping, keeping people updated on, um, on your results and, you know, your sponsors and, you know, what goes into racing, kind of more behind the scenes stuff too. Um, you you want to be able to put together a race recap every race. And I would obviously definitely highly recommend putting together a race preview um, too, you know, before you even go out there. And, um, you know, that all starts with really garnering the contacts. Um, so again, you're going to have to do a little bit of networking and you can do this online too, but, you know, find, find the biggest, uh, media outlets within your sport. So if we're talking about the, the UTV world, then you're, you're talking about, um, dirt wheels and UTV action, um, and UTV underground, UTV guide, um, you know, ATV escape. I mean, the ATV scene, there's all these different ones that, that come in here, um, that, you can send out a press release to and, and, you know, and, and really encourage them to be able to post it, whether they have it on their forum or whether they actually do post it in their magazine. I mean, that, that's what you want is you want to be able to, uh, you know, just keep your, keep your face and keep your name in front of these guys. Now I will say, you know, don't expect them to post it the first time. Um, you know, just because it, it's not, it's not necessarily something that, uh, that they will do, but at the same time, if you keep, sending it to them and stuff and keep your name in front of them, they will end up posting it and they will end up helping you. And, you know, what comes out of that is even more PR opportunities, you know, because they'll see that you have a vested stake um, in what not only your race program, but also being able to promote people within the industry and with a media outlet, it goes twofold because, you know, just like you guys need, uh, you know, sponsored writers and, and everybody needs uh, the press out of it. Well, it it helps the magazine as well because they or the website because they get the press out of it as well. So again, like I said, it it's really a twofold deal where you know you're providing a service and they're providing a service too by publishing your content. But you know you guys both benefit out of the deal because chances are if they publish something on you, then you're gonna say, oh man, thanks so much to Dirt Wheels for put my uh, you know put my race car or put my press release in the in the magazine and, you know, Hey, I went out and got third or I went and got first. And, you know, this was, uh, just a great experience and appreciate you guys running the, uh, running the story on me. I mean, that's, that's kind of how the, the cycle runs. Right. And, you know, the more that, uh, the more that you do that, the more chances you have. And, um, you know, it's, it's all, it's good win-win for everybody really. Definitely. And I also think the networking piece is, is key to that too. You know, stay in touch yeah. with, people who are influencers in the industry, you know, that, that do have access to magazines or PR or, you know, journalists, form some relationships there. Um, you know, I mean, honestly, I won't get into all the details, but like with, you know, you and I have been talking for what, I don't know, maybe close to a year now, I think since Jess came on the show. So for people who don't know, we've met, mentioned Jess a couple of times with Jess Klein. Uh, you know, you guys have been in a relationship for a while now and she was on the mm -hmm. show for, shoot 30 episode 35 six i don't know uh but you <laughs> but she connected me with you right and then mm -hmm. we've been talking a little bit and then i just tried to connect you with somebody what two or three weeks ago like hey this this person's interested in some uh getting some pr and uh you know we'll see maybe i'll go somewhere maybe it won't but there's uh right i i think that is part of the journey is 
make that's what I mean by networking is ask the questions, hey, is there someone else that that you know that I can connect with or even if you know somebody, connect them. Like what you put out into the world it comes back to you. So if you want to get a, if you want to get connected with a key influencer, try to connect somebody else. That's mm-hmm. And then it, it will somehow recirculate back where you, you build your network even even more. And if it doesn't, whatever, at least you help somebody else in the process. Exactly. And, and one of the – another way I was thinking about too is if you're out of any of the races, some of the, one of the best ways to meet uh, media people too is go and, go and talk to the photographers. They usually all have these crazy construction-like vests going on, you know, when they're out uh, photographing the race or, or shooting video and stuff. and those are the guys that, I mean, they know they're either a part of the media outlet or they know somebody from the media outlet because they're selling their photos, um, you know, to the magazines, to the websites and stuff. So go network with those guys because they, the more that you talk to them and the more that, um, you know, your face is in front of them, they'll be able to connect you um, and be able to, you know, just make sure that you're, you're not only getting, um, you know, photos of yourself and stuff too, so, so that you can use them for your portfolio or your proposals um, or recaps or anything, but also, um, it allows you, you know, to, uh, it, it basically, it encourages the photographers to be able to submit photos and kind of push your name or your, your photos, um, to the site as well. So just another way to to really kind of network, like you were saying, um, you know, with people that are, that are there on the ground at the races or at the events with you. That's good. We've never had that tip on here before. That makes really good sense. Network with the photographers, they know that they know the people they know the connections um it that's probably a reason why like for anybody who's in off-road knows the name harlan foley you know he's involved (laughs) in every single event i don't know how he must not sleep but he's in every single event across the across the united states and uh like he knows everybody you know it yeah uh, harlan i'm uh... pretty sure (laughs) yeah oh uh i got i like that harlan He's a good guy. Yeah, we might <laughs> he's, we might need a separate episode for that. Yes, and he I mean he's got stories for days, but definitely uh if you can meet Harlan one day, do it. He's not only got some great stories, just a good dude. He's got a great family and uh he'll be able to uh definitely get your photos in places too. He's really good yeah. at that. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know what? We're going to completely skip uh the main event here because we hit the rest of the section is really hard. Got some good info, uh, so I feel good about that. But I do want to head to the finish line and just kind of wrap things up. Uh, so, Casey, what's one thing that, you know, if everybody listening forgot 99.9% of what we talked about and they just could remember that 0.01%, what would be that thing that they should take away from this conversation? Um, I think with anything, um, you know, be yourself and, and – uh, you know, just let that, let your personality and, and your, um, uh, just your ideas and everything come across in everything you do. Um, you know, whether you're writing proposals or, you know, talking to, uh, media outlets and stuff. Um, it really, it goes a long way if you're, if you're just, um, true to who you are and, um, you know, you, you obviously, you, you can't diverge from that, you know, um, and stuff. So, I think uh, that's one of my my biggest takeaways too is is to uh, to just always be yourself and be thankful for uh, not only where you come from and stuff, but it really uh, you know be thankful for where you're at as well um, because it really comes across in all of your communication, um, whether uh, like I said, whether you're writing the proposals or you're writing recaps and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, companies love to be able to work with uh, people who um, just show their true self, and and it, uh, it you know like I said it shows across in all communication. Definitely, and that's it's definitely common feedback here, and I want people to really think about this. Um, being yourself is not as easy as it sounds, especially when there's a spotlight on. You need to understand yourself better than you think. Uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time uh, coaching people, whether it's you know on this podcast or other managers or employees or whatever it is, and that is one of the main things, if you can understand yourself and how you operate, uh, you're going to see much, you're going to see success in life. So you need to figure out what it is that makes you, you, and just run with that. 
it's the that is the only way, in my opinion, that people are gonna take you seriously and really engage with you. You gotta be yourself. If you try to fake it or be something that you're not, it's unless you're some amazing actor or actress, it's not gonna work, and people are gonna they're they're not gonna let you into their circle of trust. And that's where you need to be at. Uh, to be a, a successful sponsored rider or racer. Yeah, totally. You said it perfect. I mean, there, there's, there's so many people um, that that look at a big, uh, just say Red Bull sponsorship or something, and oh man, I got to do this and I got to kind of be this personality to, um, you know, to be able to achieve that end goal, which is to get that sponsorship. When in reality, um, you don't need to, and you don't need to win every race, or you don't need to be this certain person or anything. Um, the best thing, like you said, that you can do is, is really just, just harness, uh, who you are and, and, you know, make sure that that comes across and everything. And, and, um, yeah, just, like I said, just, just literally, I know we keep saying it, but it's really be, be, um, be who you are and, and be proud of it as well, you know, because we all have one thing that one thing we've been talking about a little bit on the sponsored rider club on Facebook, uh, because I've been beating up on Kyle Bush a lot. I haven't posted enough stuff on there. That's not the best about it, but you know, one thing that you can't, you, you can't deny this M and M's who's Kyle Bush's sponsor is getting a lot of media coverage right now because Kyle's videos where he's acting rude and saying crazy stuff, they're going viral. And I mean, it's, in my opinion, I don't think that's the right image that M and M's would want to convey, but I don't know. Maybe there's someone out there that does, right? <laughs> yeah. That, you know what I mean? And that's part of the thing. Like, I don't know if I could go to Kurt Bush. Actually, I can. If you watch, oh wait, not Kurt Bush. I like Kurt Bush. Kyle Bush. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Now I mixed them up. The M and M's one. The M and M's Bush from NASCAR. I think it's I think it's Kyle Bush, but he. Yeah, um, Kyle. Yeah. You can tell people have coached him to say you need to be positive when you're in front of the media, and he does this fake smirky positive thing that like it's so ungenuine. I think that's what I I think that's what irks me about about him is you can tell that he's like laughing in the face of this coaching that he's received from somebody, and it's almost like you know what? Let this guy just be crazy and. I don't know. Maybe it's not M and M's. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a, a brand that might promote promote that. I don't know. I'm just gonna make up a brand like Rude and Reckless Clothing. Great. Like, <laughs> let's give this guy a Rude and Reckless Clothing sponsorship because that's the type of people that we want wearing our clothes. And uh, I don't know. So I guess if you if you are like Kyle Bush, and may, may, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe you should still be like that. But I don't want to sponsor you. But uh, I don't know. Like you gotta be yourself. If like if you're trying to if you're trying to be somebody else, it's just not gonna it's not gonna work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If it's any consolation when we were we were doing an article on Kyle Busch and, and Greg Biffle one time, and uh, he he is pretty cool on the on just hanging out with him separate from the camera. Now what you see yes. on the camera is obviously a totally different Kyle Busch. So um, and Greg Biffle, you know, he's obviously. He's a good guy too, but um, I, you know, like I said I'm not a fan of how Kyle acts on on the camera. But again, that goes back to what you're saying is is be yourself because, you know, yes, Kyle and Greg share the same passion for off road. You know, we were out riding with them in Glamis, but at the same time, you know, definitely uh, the guy who I saw at at at, uh, at Glamis was not the same guy that I would see on camera. So bridge right. that gap and and definitely you know don't. I wouldn't recommend doing what he does all the time. Right. So anyway, right. I need to stop. I need to make a commitment to myself to stop ripping on Kyle Bush. You know, Cause <laughs> he's got way more figured out than I do. I think so. I need to just cut that one, nip it in the bud. Uh, with that, we'll transition to how is, how do we connect with you? What's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, yeah, email is great. Um, you can reach out to me anytime. Uh, my email is Casey, which is spelled C-A-S-E-Y, at T-G-H, creative.com. Um, or you can follow me. Uh, if you can figure out how to spell my last name, <laughs> you can follow <laughs> me on social media, at Air Cordero, um, and it's E-I-R-O at the end. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the best two ways to uh, to get in touch. I really try to 
keep track of, uh, you know, email and stuff and, and getting back to everybody. So, um, I really, I encourage, uh, all inquiries and, th- and that kind of stuff just to be able to, um, you know, I, like, like we were talking about earlier, just network and, and, uh, meet new people. Cause that's what it's all about. It's a small community here and we look forward to, uh, to meeting everybody. So it's cool. Sounds great. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to share your background, a lot of your experiences. Um, I think we got into really good insights. Um, especially, I like how we got into some specific tips about what people can do, like going and talking to a photographer. I think that's phenomenal. Um, but we got to close things out, so I'm going to leave you with this. Have fun and ride safe. Cool. Thank you so much, man. Thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, which is powered by Amsoil. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming guests. So we have Kayla and Dave Yakov coming up next to talk about youth racing and sponsorship. Also, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. That would be great. It is one of the biggest ways to promote visibility for the show. And make sure that you're following us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Now, Facebook, though, that's where we tend to spend a lot of time because we do our live recordings there. So we just had Sprint Car Racer and owner of High Octane Coffee, Joey Sylvester, on our live show, which aired June 18th of 2018. Now, the audio version of this show will be available in June of 2018. It actually might release before the Kayla and Dave Yakov episode comes out, depending on how... Uh, efficient I am at the editing process. So look for that to come up very soon. To get some insider access into the show and upcoming guests, go ahead and check out the Sponsored Rider Club on Facebook. And a special thanks for this show goes out to our sponsors, Amsoil, Armor Coat, Solder Weld, Bold Racing, TopThePodium.com, and Crash Addict Industries. And I also want to give another quick shout out to our other partners, including GSP XTV Axles, MBRP, HMK USA, Sudboy Traction, and One Stop Performance. I look forward to serving you again next week. Until then, have fun and ride safe.